Welcome to Stories Telling Stories. This is the debut of Something New. This is uh, STS Presents Locked in a Vacancy. This is a new mini-series where we present stories of isolation and solitude, which seems appropriate, especially at this point in time. At the date of recording slash date of release, it is April 1st, 2020, and if you're listening to this in the future, we are currently in the midst of the coronavirus COVID-19 lockdown and isolation. I hate that I know that this is like going to be an important enough part of history that people will be like, ah, yes, that thing. Now, for you longtime listeners of Stories Telling Stories, you know that I usually script everything to a T. And I figured since we're trying something new, we're going to we're gonna do part of this series unscripted. I've got my, uh, my co-reader here with me. What up? Oh, did you want me to introduce myself? Yeah, if you want myself? to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Rick Shaw Tom. And uh, we're going to be reading the Cask of Amontillado together. One of Edgar Allan Poe's finest, I might say. I um, am currently getting into character of Fortunato because I am Fortunato enough to have a box of wine. It's not Amontillado, unfortunately, but it gets the job done. Yeah, well, so in terms of Edgar Allan Poe's stories and notoriety, where would you say this one falls, like in terms of his collection as a whole? Oh, that is a hard question. <laughs> yeah, coming right out swinging with the big ones. All, all right, I'm going back to all of my college classes, but Cask of Amontillado is one of maybe three Edgar Allan Poe stories that I have written, and it's the only one in which the entire plot, I can tell you what happens. Guy finds his drunk, not his drunk frenemy, and <laughs> tricks him into going to a part of the crypt that he is able to just wall him the fuck up. And now that I'm older and know what the catacombs of Paris are, I can appreciate that a little bit more. And I think being an adult now and having co-workers and people in your adult life i sympathize i sympathize with this guy more not with fortnato with the guy who's walling him up i'm like oh, yeah, yeah totally like i i know guys I, like that i dude i assumed that's who you were talking <laughs> about i didn't think that you were talking about i mean i sympathize with fortnato a lot because i have a tendency to be dressing in motley and wearing bells and all that but at the same time, there are some fuckers that I just kind of want to make disappear. And I want to see the people that uh, we mutually know be like, where is he? And I'll be like, I don't know. Why did you say it like that? I don't know. <laughs> but as a kid, like when I was first exposed to this story, I was like, oh, poor Fortunato. Like, I, I feel so bad for him. He didn't know what was happening. And he was his his innocent drunkenness was taken advantage of by this horrible man who was just out for blood but in becoming the character it's like you know not really here's I, the like the one guy who he really doesn't like more than any other i mean yeah he went overboard i'm not justifying this bizarre homicide but well, there's some not. justification there well we don't know that. I think that Edgar Allan Poe keeps it purposefully vague so that we can take whatever asshole that we just want to see disappear and we're like, yeah, Fortunato probably did that. He probably interjects a lot during the company meetings in ways that are not <laughs> productive and are just time consuming and but, just make my brain hurt. And when this was first published, this was published in 1847. There were people like that back then. No, no. What I'm saying is like, this was the time period where if someone like scuffed your boot on the street, you could say, you have offended me, sir, and challenge you to a duel where you face at each other with pistols. I would just rather f duel where the weapon in question is the boot. <laughs> Literally kicking your ass to death. Well, everything's legal in New Jersey. Uh, nicely done. But um, going back to the original question, like where this falls in the grand arc of his writings, I think this is right up there is, I think, not necessarily his best piece of writing, but certainly one of his most important. You're sounding much more learned about his writings than I am because I have only read this Pit in the Pendulum and I think I read Mask of the Red Death, but... I read each of these at a time period when I was not 
able to fully... Ugh. Sorry, the wine. I was not able to fully appreciate the depths of the writing. To me, Pit and the Pendulum was all about, like, the guy's got the struggle of how to survive these torture situations, and he manages to survive just long enough to be rescued. This, you don't get any of that. It's basically keep the drunken guy in the dark who's... He is the... I've had enough experiences at college where somebody was like, yo, I've got weed back at my room, and you just start following. <laughs> and you just keep going because it's like, all right, when are we going to spark this? This is going to happen. And this is why I sympathize with Fortunato because I would be the guy to be like, yo, we're still going to do those drugs, right? <laughs> <laughs> He'd be putting the last brick in place and be like, is it on your side of the wall? You gonna pass it through that brick <laughs> hole? Well, he he did stick the torch in at the end, so yeah. It's like, hey, here, here you go. Have some light. Thanks. <laughs> Meanwhile, I've been playing like hours upon hours of Skyrim every day, and most of the plots in that are basically, hey, go to my family's crypts. Maybe there's zombies, and that's the entire setting that I've been picturing as we read through this, or as we are going to read through this. I don't even know if we're supposed to have not read this yet. <laughs> we're just talking in about this it. narrative. So. But in terms of Again, going back to that big question, like I think the I think the main stories pe that people associate with Edgar Allan Poe being the Raven, and oh fuck, I forgot he wrote the Raven and the Telltale Heart. Oh, I forgot he wrote the Telltale Heart. <laughs> I think those are really the two like most prevalent of his stories in, in pop culture. Um, you may have another opinion, but I think this one has not wrong. No, I just forgot that those were Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> He was a prevalent dude. Well, I guess that the main theme that I can get throughout his writings, keeping in mind Telltale Heart and the Raven, is just being able to interject himself into another person's mindset of the, uh, of, uh, uh, okay, I, well, I've killed this guy. What do I do now? I'm going <laughs> to chop him up and stick him in the floorboards. Or, I'm alone at night. Fuck, that bird's freaking me the fuck out. Or, man, I really want to kill Gary. <laughs> That's how I take it. It's just like it, the standard office Gary. That's that's who he gets rid of. Everybody's got that revenge fantasy. Uh, at least, well, maybe not. Maybe I'm revealing too much about myself. <laughs> I've got like five Garys. <laughs> and then maybe, maybe he was actually a secret serial killer and his stories are telling us where he hid the bodies. Cool, cool. Hey, Except he does tell us where he hit the bodies. There's one under the floor. Yep. There's one behind the walls. Yup, there's one right underneath the fucking pendulum. And there's one that he fed to the birds. God damn it, you said it before I could get a <laughs> chance to. And now, now I'm thinking about the other stories telling stories. It's like, all right, how many people have you thrown in Lake Champlain? <laughs> Five. Enough. <laughs> Is one enough? Hey, it, it's a small lake and there's a big monster and he's hungry. Oh, well, we got to feed Champ somehow. <laughs> All right, well, on that note, we're going to dive right into the story here. This is The Cask of Amontillado, as read by Eric Hill and Rick Chateau, right here on STS Presents Locked in a Vacancy. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length I would be avenged. This was definitely settled, but the very definitiveness with which I was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed I had given Fortunato cause to doubt my good will. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. <laughs> he had a weak point, this Fortunato, Although in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared, he prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. 
few Italians have the true virtuoso spirit. For the most part, their enthusiasm is adopted to suit the time and opportunity, to practice imposture upon the British and Austrian millionaires. In painting and gemmery, Fortunato, like his countrymen, was a quack. But in the matter of old wines, he was sincere. In this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself, and bought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk, one evening, during the supreme madness of the carnival season, that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth, for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had on a tight-fitting, peri-striped dress, and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done wringing his hand. I said to him, My dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. How remarkably well you are looking today. But I have received a pipe of what passes for a montelado, and I have my doubts. <laughs> How? he said. A montelado? A pipe? Impossible. And in the middle of carnival? I have my doubts, I replied, and I was silly enough to pay the full amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. You were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado? I have my doubts. Amontillado? And I must satisfy them. Amontillado? As you are engaged, I am on my way to Lucchesi. If anyone has a critical turn, it is he. He Lucchesi will tell me. Lucchesi cannot tell Amontillado from Sherry. And yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Come, let us go. Whither? <laughs> to your vaults. My friend, no, no, I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. Lucchesi. I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no, it is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Let us go, nevertheless. The cold is merely nothing. Montalado, you have been imposed upon. And as for Lucchesi, he cannot distinguish Sherry from a Montalado. Thus speaking, Fortunato possessed himself of my arm and put on a mask of black silk and drawing a low loquery closely about my person, I suffered him to hurry me to Palazzo. There were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry in honor of the time. I had told them I should not return until the morning, and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient. I well knew to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, as soon as my back was turned. I took from their sconces two flambeaux, and, giving one to Fortunato, bowed him through several suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent, and stood together upon the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montresors. The gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. Mm, the pipe, he said. It is farther on, said I, but observe the white webwork which gleans from these cavern walls. He turned towards me, and looked into my eyes with two filmy orbs that distilled the room of intoxication. Niter? He asked, at length. <coughs> Niter, I replied. How long have you had that cough? <coughs> my poor friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. It is nothing, he said. At last. Come, I said, with decision. We will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy as once I was. You are a man to be missed. For me, it is no matter. We will go back. You will be ill, and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucchesi. Enough! He said. The cost of mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True, true, I replied. 
And indeed, I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily, but you should use all proper caution. A draft of his medoc will defend us from the damps. Here, I knocked off the neck of a bottle which I drew from a long row of its fellows that laid upon the mold. Drink, I said, presenting him the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded with, to me familiarly, while his bells jingled. I drink, he said, to the buried that repose around us. And I to your long life. He again took my arm and we proceeded. These vaults, he said, are extensive. The Montresors, I replied, were a great and numerous family. I forget your arms. A huge human foot, odor, in a field of azure. The foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nemo me impune laciesit. Good. The wine sparkled in his eyes, and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the medic. We had passed through long halls of piled skeletons, with casks and puncheons intermingling into the innermost recesses of the catacombs. I paused again, and this time I made bold to seize Fortunato by an arm above the elbow. The nitre, I said. See? It increases. It hangs like moss upon the vaults. We are below the river's bed. The drops of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we will go back ere it is too late. Your cough. It is nothing, he said. Let us go on. But first, another draft of the medoc. I broke and reached him a flagon of de grave. He emptied it out of breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He laughed and threw the bottle upwards with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the movement, a grotesque one. You do not comprehend, he said. Not I, I replied. (laughs) Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You are not of the Masons. Uh, Yes, yes, I said. Yes, yes. You? (laughs) Impossible. A Mason? A Mason, I replied. (laughs) A sign, he said. A sign. It is this, I answered, (gasps) producing a trowel from beneath the folds of my reliquaire. You jest, he exclaimed. Recoiling a few paces. But let us proceed to the Amontillado. Be it so, I said, replacing the tool beneath the cloak and again offering him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the Amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descents, passed on, and descending again, arrived at a deep crypt in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeau rather to glow than flame. At the most remote end of the crypt there appeared another less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains, piled to the vault overhead, in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. Three sides of this interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner. From the fourth side, the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall, thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, we perceived a still interior crypt or recess, in depth about four feet, in width three, in height six or seven. It seemed to have been constructed for no especial use within itself, but formed merely the interval between two of the colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs, and was backed by one of their circumscribing walls of solid granite." It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, endeavored to pry into the depths of the recess. Its termination, the feeble light, did not enable us to see. Proceed, I said. Herein is the Amontillado. As for Lucchese... He is an ignoramus! interrupted my friend, as he stepped unsteadily forward, while I followed immediately at his heels. In niche, and finding an instant, he had reached the extremity of the niche, and finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more, and I had fettered him to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples, distant from each other about two feet horizontally. From one of these depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links about his waist, I was but work of a few seconds to secure it. He was too much astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Pass your hand, I said. 
over the wall. You cannot help feeling the nitre. Indeed, it is very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No, then I must positively leave you. But first, I must render you all little attentions in my power. Montalado! ejaculated my friend, not yet recovered from his astonishment. True, I replied. The Amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones which I had before spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials, and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of the masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low moaning cry from the depths of the recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There was a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier, and the third, and the fourth, and then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which that I might hearken to it with more satisfaction, I ceased my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interrupting the fifth, sixth, and seventh tier. The wall was now nearly upon a level with my breast. I again paused and, holding the flambeau over the mason work, threw a feeble rays upon the figure within. A succession of loud and shrill screams, bursting suddenly from the throat of the chained form, seemed to thrust me violently back. For a brief moment I hesitated. I trembled. Unsheathing my rapier, I began to grope it about the recess, but the thought of an instant reassured me. I placed my hand upon the solid fabric of the catacombs and felt satisfied. I reapproached the wall. I replied to the yells of him who clamored. I re-echoed. I aided. I surpassed them in volume and in strength. I did this, and the clamor grew still. It was now midnight, and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth tier. I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight, I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from out the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs on my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice, which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, <laughs> A very good joke indeed! An excellent jest! We will have many a rich laugh about it at the palazzo <laughs> over the wine. <laughs> the Amontillado, I said. <laughs> yes, the Amontillado. <laughs> but is it not getting late? Will there not be awaiting us at the palazzo, the Lady Fortunato and the rest? Let us be gone. Yes, I said. Let us be gone. For the love of God, Mr. Sewer. Yes, I said, for the love of God. But to these words, I hearken in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud, Fortunato! No answer. I called again, Fortunato! No answer still. I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth in return only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick. It was the dampness of the catacombs that made it so. I hastened to make an end to my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pace, requiescant. Locked in a Vacancy, Stories of Isolation and Solitude is a product of Stories Telling Stories, produced in association with Seeing Red Productions and STS Media Group. Buried behind a live studio audience at Milt House Studios in Milton, Vermont. Casting around the globe to your frontal lobe, wherever podcasts are found. Be sure to like us on Facebook and Instagram for all the latest updates. 
There's also a Patreon page where you can show your support for the show for as little as a dollar a month. And until next time, stay whimsical.